chapter 17. Creative Thoughts Within every believer, there is within them the ability to experience creative thoughts. This will change your life if you receive what I'm saying in this chapter. Here is a deeper understanding on the mind, specifically the creative power of thoughts. Romans 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our entire lives will be transformed and metamorphosed when our minds are renewed. This will allow us to soar and not have to conform to the world's standard of living and being. We'll be fully capable of proving the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A mindset is when our minds are programmed and set to respond a specific way or project a certain impression when encountering different words, pictures, situations, etc. They have preconceived thoughts and feelings about church because of previous experiences that have been grafted into their minds. A church they attended when they were younger, a religious fanatic they watched on television, or the enthusiastic preacher on the car radio. That mindset is about to be changed and renewed. The bride of Christ is about to become a very heavenly creature. Ungodly and worldly mindsets are spiritual strongholds that restrain us from soaring. Those bondages are broken by the transformation that comes from the pressure and isolation in the cocoon. We are liberated through the constructions and pressures that the Lord allows to come upon us in the cocoon. The restraints of self-dependence are broken as we rely more and more on the Spirit of God, being strengthened in our inner person so we can rise to higher altitudes. Those who want to avoid those trials will be confined as worms to the earth. We can choose to move with the current of the Spirit and let the trials of this present age work for us, or we can continue to wade through the shallow water and never reach our destination, which only comes after the rapids. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Paul said the sufferings and tribulations of this present age are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us, in us, and through us. Romans 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. Unfortunately, many leaders from a lack of maturity have restrained and kept the church in a state of infancy. They are in danger of losing all. This metamorphosis is mandatory. Trying to save someone from it is doing him harm. The chick needs the struggle of getting out of the egg to produce blood flow into its extremities. If not, there's a good chance of losing its life after birth. The struggle for life is necessary for walking in the fullness of life. Humans and God have a creative ability that can be exercised through the mind to recreate the world around us. Psalms 139, verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy work, and that my soul knoweth right well. We were created in the image and likeness of God. The same creative nature of God is resonant within humankind. Creative authority is best released through love, the most excellent way. With all that has been given to humanity in terms of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the ability to cooperate with the Spirit of God in the anointing, there still remains a fuller and more abundant way to minister the mind, heart, and power of God in the earth. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 9 through 13. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. 
but the greatest of these is charity. Many people take the phrase from the perfect calm and conclude it is referring to the second coming of Christ. The phrase, however, is talking about love. The whole chapter is talking about love and our lives being perfected in love. Paul is talking about a new standard, a new level. He says we should earnestly desire the best gifts and graces, but there still is a better way, the way of love. Galatians 5 verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. When that which is perfect is come, looking through a glass darkly will be done away with. We will come to this perfection of love from one level to another, more fully, deeply, and intimately. It is important for us to keep in mind that thoughts are seeds. Thoughts have life in them and will reproduce. This simply means all things reproduce after their own kind. Galatians 1 verses 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. This creation law affects us continually as it shapes our future and determines our present. Even now our circumstances are being determined by this law. We need to stop blaming everybody and their brother, including the devil, for our present circumstances and to take responsibility for what is growing in our lives. This creation law is irrevocable and unchangeable. We plant trees and gardens, and they reproduce after their kind. The fertile soil where we unknowingly plant most seeds is in the garden of our heart. What you plant there will reproduce and come forth. Thoughts are simply seeds. Passion and strong desire are the heat that causes the seed to spin into life. Babies are conceived in passion. So, too, inner passion gives life to the seeds in our heart. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. This means that as a person believes and thinks in his heart, so he will become. What he thinks about will be manifested in his life. Matthew 7 verses 1 and 2. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye met, it shall be measured to you again. The seed of judgment sown will reap a tree of judgment. Because of this law, we must live every moment in thought and action as we desire the future to be. The human mind is one of the greatest earthly powers. Mark 11, verse 23. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Jesus isn't speaking metaphorically. He's talking literally. You don't even have to be a Christian for this to work. There are many people displaying supernatural feats and abilities illegally by this principle alone. Remember, the human mind is a great earthly power. This universal law cannot be changed. Mark 11 verse 24, Therefore, I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Jesus is saying to believe, be confident and desire what you are asking for, and you will receive it. Our thoughts aren't momentarily insignificant whiffs, but are the seeds of desire that produce and chart the course of our present and future life. If thoughts are seeds, then how are they planted? When a thought firmly connects with emotion, a supernatural power or force is released. If you hold your thoughts until they are connected with your emotion, feelings, and desires, it releases the power of life and light. This principle is similar to Matthew 18, verse 19. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. When your emotions agree with your thinking, it shall be done. This is the power of union and agreement. It works for both God thoughts and demonic thoughts. This seed of thought, when energized by emotion, will literally create an environment of love and joy around your entire household. 
Any thoughts that connect with our emotions become a very strong power and determine the atmosphere around us. The church has taught us for years that emotions are not important. I say to you that emotions, as well as your thought life, are the creative side of you. Your emotions are essential for everything to happen. Jesus was moved with an emotion called compassion and released miracles. Matthew 20, verse 34. So Jesus had compassion on them, and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Mark 1, verse 41. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. Compassion releases miracles, even the raising of the dead. Luke 7, verses 11 through 17. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nainan, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched a briar, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying, that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God had visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. The power and glory of God in the anointing are released through the gateway of human affection. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 12 Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. We have to feel what we do. When our thinking connects with our feelings, a seed is planted by desire, and a power is released. James 1, verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We need to be careful what we are thinking. Every time we think, we place a spiritual offering at the door that energizes and powers that thought. An evil desire is conceived when the thought and the emotion come together. This forms a creative power bond of agreement that brings forth death. Brings forth means to breed or create, and is the same as a plant that is produced from the seed. When I meditate on the word and revelation begins to flow, my whole being seems to be flooded with light, not only light, but flooded with a tranquil peace and life of God. The revelation that is coming from God's mind flows through my emotion and makes a place in my spirit man for seed to be planted and to grow. Revelation isn't just an abstract thought. It is connected with a feeling that buries life deep inside us. Seeds are planted. Conception has taken place. If watered, the revelation will give birth in our life. As a man thinks, so he will become. This new glory generation will move in the understanding of how to release wonders in the creative power of the imaginations. They will birth the will and purposes of God in the earth with mind-blowing authority over physical elements in the natural realm. The creative power of the imagination is not a new age or occult principle. It is a kingdom reality created by God to manifest in the natural what is seen in the spirit. The demonic world or the occult can use it to birth destruction in the natural by curses that materialize from unholy allegiance. But God really gave us an imagination to come under the influence of the Holy Spirit and birth life, freedom, and destiny into our life. Unfortunately, we've been taught to believe that anything to do with using our imagination is new age and is used to advance the kingdom of darkness. In reality, new agers, And the occult stole something very precious from the saints of God and have perverted it to the point that we are afraid to come near it. It is time we take the power to envision back. It is time that we start using what God has given to us to wreak havoc on the kingdom of darkness. We must visualize what we desire to become in God. Actually, we must see ourselves as we really are in Christ. Then it will manifest as reality in our lives. 
The imagination is a creative tool that brings into the physical world that which sets dormant in the unseen realm. We can use our imagination to transform the world around us, both for good and for evil. You cannot walk in something until you see yourself walking in it, you say. Visualizing is new age. You've been visualizing since you were born. Every time you think about something, every time you daydream, you're visualizing. It's part of the thinking process. There have been a number of people throughout history who have broken through simple spiritual concepts into the upper kingdom realities. They understood genuine kingdom laws and began to practice them. Only a handful of people have risen to a level in God where they could overcome any earthly obstacle in life, even overcoming death. Not just Enoch, either. It is easy to blame the devil and others for things that happen to us in life. But in actuality, our present circumstances are the direct result of where our heart is set in thought. Matthew 5, verse 28. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Everyone who looks with his eyes and thinks it is mine has committed and birthed the act of adultery in his heart. It's already done. The mind and the imagination are the same thing. It's just as if you had already done it. In every atom there is life and life. When God created the universe, he breathed them out of his imagination. The newly created atoms were all spinning harmoniously according to their own vibration, their own unique created order. However, when Adam fell from the glory of God, the result was so dramatic that it shifted the world on its axis. The earth wasn't the only thing that shifted. Each individual atom was knocked off rhythm from its original spin. Everything was affected, even at the subatomic level. When this happened, the door was wide open for Satan to corrupt and alter things genetically. The good news is that all of creation was pre-programmed to respond to love. If we have love emanating from us, the smallest atom can feel it and will respond to it. Atoms were birthed from love, and as created particles feel love and respond to it. Animals feel it, trees feel it, and all nature feels it. Atoms will cooperate with what you desire and speak because they recognize your sonship and know that you have dominion over the world. What you emanate leaves a trail and affects everything around you. If you come home with a bad attitude, before you even open your mouth, the first thing that's going to recognize it is your cat or dog. Creation knows because it is sensitized to emotion. All of creation waits eagerly for the children of God to step into their full understanding of sonship. Creation knows that we have power and authority to free it from the bondage of decay, corruption, sin, and death that entered the world during the fall. Romans 8, verses 19 through 21. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. All creation responds to the more excellent and perfect way of love. It is through love that the curse will be lifted and creation will enter into freedom. Signs, wonders, and miracles come through love. We just have to keep on belief out. Mark 9 verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. I think it would be safe to say that not much is possible, then if you don't believe. James says that when we ask God for something, we should do it with faith and not doubt in our hearts. James 1 verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. He continues to explain what we should expect to receive from the Lord if we do indeed harbor doubt in our hearts. James 1, verses 7 and 8. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. 
A devil-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Doubt opens the door to unbelief, and unbelief is a tremendous evil power that cuts us off from the promises of God. Unbelief is a spirit that is like a dark, demonic hood of blindness and deception. We must see violently with this spirit. We shouldn't have even a speck of doubt in our hearts. Jesus said in Mark 1, verse 15, I am saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Do you see that? We overcome doubt and unbelief by repenting and turning to the Lord, changing our way of thinking, then believing. Sometimes this takes a fierce step of faith in the right direction and a forceful decision to believe. It is necessary to learn to hold our focus on the Lord, to set our thoughts and our imagination in faith until they connect with our feelings and emotions. When we continually do this, heaven seeds are planted and faith begins to grow and flourish and come alive. We must begin to see ourselves walking in the light of these things. Start to imagine yourself walking in your future and destiny and align yourself with the kingdom of God. It will come to pass. This is the way it is. God did it this way in the beginning. He thought it, saw it, and spoke it. Then it came into existence. Remember Proverbs 23, verse 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. We can either believe and receive, or doubt and go without. There are many things that fascinate me in God, but none have come so close to the mystery of our identity in Christ. Just thinking that we have been cut out of the same swatch of clothing as God causes me to rush with anticipation. When I think about being alive in eternity before I was born, or before the worlds were created, it makes me want to know the reality of that life in eternity. I want to know what it's like and what's happening there. The reality is you are a spirit. Your spirit came from heaven and has been in existence for a long time. Your spirit has memories of life in heaven. When your spirit came into your body at birth, it became wrapped in the soul, and those memories began to fade and were eventually lost. Before Jesus was born on earth, he was a spirit. He existed in the bosom of the Father. He came to earth as a spirit and lived in a body with a soul. John 1 verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now Jesus is still a man, spirit, soul, and body, except he now has a resurrected body since he rose from the dead. Yes, we are spirit, but God gave us a soul and body also. We are new creations in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Yes, we are spirit beings, but we are human beings too. All of our spirit, soul, and body need to come into alignment with the kingdom of God. This only happens through the spirit first, though. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is important that we as spirit, soul, and body blend as one so we can interact with the spiritual realm and the physical realm. Heaven was first a spiritual world, but then God created the earth and brought heaven into it in the Garden of Eden. He brought heaven into a physical dimension. When you were born again, Christ came into your spirit, and in that seed is the fullness of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are filled with eternity past, present, and future. 1 John 2, verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Everything past, present, and future has already been written on the fabric of your spirit person. If you come into union with the Holy Spirit, you have access to know all things. Many times while ministering, I will begin to see things through the impression of my mind in the Spirit. I have learned that when ministering in the Holy Spirit, I am under the influence of the supernatural, and that what's flowing into my mind is from heaven. I've also learned that as I begin to speak in the natural about what I'm seeing in the Spirit, 
it creates the framework for those things to be created in the natural. The reality of the spirit realm is all around us. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will just give you a hunch or a slight impression. But if you follow him, you'll be surprised at what happens. Some of the most extraordinary miracles in your life will happen because you follow the tiniest nudge from the Holy Spirit. When Abraham was an old man, God promised that his descendants would be like the stars. How was it possible for Abraham to become the father of two great nations? God told him to look into heaven, to look at the stars. Abraham set his eyes to the heavens and looked. He imagined, he believed. This impossible situation became possible when he visualized it as a reality. As he looked at the stars, he saw his family. God wants us to be active in our part of stepping into our destinies. God speaks the promises, but we fail to look up. We fail to visualize. We fail to see the impossible situation with eyes of faith. When we use our imagination according to the promises of God, the impossible becomes possible. God calls those things that are not, as though they already exist. When the earth was formless and void, God already saw it with form and substance and simply called it forth. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13 We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. If we see ourselves sick, broken down, and improvised, that is exactly what will be birthed in our life. If we begin to imagine ourselves as blessed of God and start calling those things that are not as though they are, they will manifest in our lives. Regardless of our race, gender, financial condition, or family situation, we must believe and speak. Let's be like Abraham and look up at the stars. Matthew 8 verses 5 through 13. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed, for I am a man under authority having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. I believe our imaginations are part of the creative nature of humanity. Everything God spoke into experience already existed in his mind and in his heart. Everything that a person builds first lives within him, within the imagination. We know that faith is not just a matter of the mind, but of the heart. When God asks us to have faith in him, he is asking us to trust him. Trust is a matter of the heart. But true faith doesn't just stay in the heart. Indeed, faith first springs from the heart but is eventually floods the rest of the individual, including the mind, the imagination, and in time, every action and word. In the story of the faith of the centurion, we see Jesus saying that he will come to the centurion's servant to heal him. Jesus was perfectly fine with going to distance, but the centurion believed within himself that his servant would be healed if only Jesus spoke the word. The centurion's faith rested in the spoken word. Because he was a man of authority, a man of the spoken word, he had his mind made up and was firmly convinced in the authority of the spoken word. It is in the way you believe, the way you imagine, and where your faith rests. Because imagination helps cultivate faith and belief, you could say, as you imagine, it will be done unto you. Another example of this scripture is in the story of the woman with an issue of blood. Mark 5, verses 27 and 28. 
when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. As we fix our eyes on Jesus and keep seeking the things above with our minds and imaginations, we will get breakthroughs. We will literally get to see the eternal realm. When we glimpse Jesus, everything will be changed. In this process, we must use our imaginations to reconstruct our entire thought lives. We must learn to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and set our affections on things above. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We will start to see ourselves and everyone around us through the eyes of Christ. We will start to see our destiny and our future glory. Then, and only then, will we be able to pull it into today. Ephesians 1 verse 17 and 18, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. When we look with the eyes of understanding, we are gazing into the eternal realm, the real realm. God can speak to us through the imagination. The devil can speak to us through the imagination. And we can use our own imagination. If we are imagining something from our own mind, it is coming from us. But imaginations that come from outside ourselves are coming from one of two sources, God or the devil. We can be imagining something from ourselves, and then all of a sudden, we receive something not from ourselves, something from God or the devil. Where did that come from, you might think? I wasn't even thinking about that. Because you are exercising your imagination, you are open to the spirit realm. The spirit realm loves to imprint pictures and thoughts into our imaginations because our imaginations are the gateway and the link that brings the spiritual into the natural. If someone constantly receives ungodly images, they may just think it's their own imagination. In reality, they actually have a demonic spirit lodged in their mind. That demonic spirit is the gatekeeper to the imagination. He guards what comes in and what goes out. Our spirit, as one with the Holy Spirit, should be the gatekeeper to our imaginations. This is why it's vital that our minds are washed with pure water, so those strongholds in the mind and imaginations can be broken and replaced. When we find our minds wandering randomly, and it leads us into perseverance, it's an indicator that there are strongholds in the mind and that we need deliverance. Deliverance is as simple as starving those strongholds and thoughts and having the powerful blood of Jesus Christ wash over us. We are the keepers of our minds. We must guard what comes into our eye gates and ear gates. When daydreaming, either you started it or someone else did. The spirit world always wants to communicate with us. The vast majority of God's communication with people in the scriptures came in visions and dreams. Remember, as a person thinks in his heart, so he becomes. Someone else has access to our minds other than us. Who is it? Learn to see for yourself. Accept the good and reject the evil. Train your mind and exercise your spiritual senses to discern the voice of God from among all the other voices. If you want to walk with God, you will have to learn to walk with Him in your imagination, having the eyes of your understanding enlightened, that you may know the things of God. The imagination is our gift from God that should be used as a tool to create and manifest the unseen into the scene. God has created us to be a thinking, imaginative, and visionary people who, with the sanctified imagination, like God. Romans 4 verse 17, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom believe, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God has given us the power to create, and not just through procreation or reproduction, but in many different ways, including artistically and visually. 
We are inventive and creative like our Father in heaven. Every physical item that surrounds you right now, whether it's a clock, a picture frame, or a coffee cup, has a certain amount of imagination and creative design put into it. Every masterpiece ever created first existed in the imagination of the artist. It is important that we see ourselves the way God sees us. We are citizens of heaven. We must be transformed from natural ways of thinking to heavenly ways. God breathed the breath of life into Adam, and he became the first living soul. When God created the breath of life, He breathed all eternity into Adam. Adam's destiny, identity, citizenship, origin, imagination, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding all came out of the eternity of eternities, directly out of God and into Adam. Psalms 139, verses 13 through 17. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! We are citizens of heaven. Our origin is not from here. We are the very offspring of God. Doesn't this tell us something of our ability to access the very home from which we came? We can use our imaginations to creatively bring into the natural that which exists in the spirit. We can release the will of God for our families, friends, ministries, businesses, cities, states, and the nations. So what's on your heart? What is your vision? You have a blueprint and destiny from God within your spirit that's unchangeable. Most often the desires in our hearts are the very things God has sealed and ordered in us by the Holy Spirit. We are capable of bringing out and birthing our destinies. If we don't, We will agonize over it until it happens. Many of us wonder what the will of God is for our lives when it's already written all over us. God gave me a new word in the Litchfield Revival. It's visionating. This is when your imagination gets consumed by God's very thoughts. There are times when I'm alone with the Lord in the Spirit, and I find myself visualizing and screaming out for things I dream about, healing the masses, casting out demons with a word, God backing up my words with powerful signs and wonders. I imagine the glory of God sweeping over a football field-sized amphitheater with Holy Spirit power and fire wiping out the whole place. I visualize the power of God covering a whole city, everybody getting saved, and miracles and healings being demonstrated in power by His radiant glory. And then I listen to the people come into the great congregation of the Lord and testify of what great things God has done for them, person after person coming forward to testify. These things will happen in my lifetime because I can see them. I've been to many of these events in the Spirit, and they are wonderful. God has put it in me to call these things forth. They will happen, and I will be a part of facilitating these mighty acts of God. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I'm going as far as to say that unless we visualize and give expression to those prophetic dreams and visions that come from the Holy One living inside us, we will begin to dry up on the vine and lose hope and courage. If that happens, eventually we might settle for far less than God's most perfect will for ourselves. We've been told for too long that we can't use our imaginations to engage God. But I'm saying you can. You are free under the direction of the Holy Spirit to engage the third heaven and to uncover truths and mysteries in the kingdom of God. If we're hungry about moving into the same kinds of experiences Ezekiel or Isaiah had, we need to start meditating over their third heaven experiences and start asking the Lord for our own. 
We need to take time to soak in the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit and use our imagination to engage heaven based on what John saw in Revelation and what Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah saw. When we engage ourselves in this manner, it is only a matter of time before we are before the very throne of God ourselves. Unless we exercise our imagination in a sanctified manner as God intended, and take back the right to use our imagination from the devil, we will be at a great disadvantage. God loves dreamers and visionaries who believe his word. We need to get a hold of God and let him get a hold of us. We need to shake heaven until we see the full fruit of our heart's desires come to pass.